we use as a social way to relate substances that do this particular increase in dopamine in the brain. Sadly, we can also get them from psychiatrists or doctors in general because we now have some sort of an epidemic of people abusing medication prescribed, I will say psychiatric medications, but they're mostly prescribed by primary care physicians or non-psychiatrists, although I have to say psychiatrists also do it. So they expose patients to chronic medications that can do the same changes and then they end up developing an addiction that if you cannot get the prescriptions medications, you are going to go for the strict medication, so you're going to jump into the wagon of the addicts. Recently, the head of the National Institute of Mental Health concluded, and he put it publicly in the internet, we're probably wrong. Psychiatric medications do, very similar to drugs, permanent changes in the brain that can promote chronicity, but in this case we call the chronicity chronic mental illness, disability and suffering. So they say we have to reconceptualize and become aware of the possible role that psychiatric medications can do, but not when you use it three, four months. When you use it long enough to induce changes in the brain, that the brain basically cannot undo and basically the disease will be established. So, it looks like addiction is not a disorder, it's a disease. It was a disorder when we thought it was just a damage to the nucleus accumbens, which patients with personality disorder wanted to feel high. Now that we have some deep within the brain areas are involved, we basically get a much more severe condition that is out of the control of voluntary actions and causes what is called the disease of addiction. It's a disease, not a disorder, because now we know what's wrong in the brain and it is neurological. We can even measure with neuroimaging. You see some areas in the brain that start growing, which is the areas that are recluded by this system to overwhelm the prefrontal cortex. So you cannot use your voluntary decision. You will basically act impulsively or automatically. Psychiatric disorders in general, addiction included, is characterized by symptoms that we don't understand because we never go through them. A medical doctor can basically understand nausea, fever, feeling sick, diarrhea. We all go through that. But when the patient is telling the doctor, I have this craving and I don't know what to do. We believe craving is just feeling a little bit of a desire. You can control it. Don't, don't do that thing. You can control it. Cravings is something we don't really understand. The closest to craving is don't eat for two or three days. And what's going to happen is that your brain is going to sense that you're getting in trouble because you're not eating, eating causes pleasure and stimulate this. So as you pass the hours, the body will give you notice that something is wrong, it's going to make you anxious, sweaty, stomach's going to start causing pain, you're going to become obsessed, you're going to start thinking about food, you are going to put yourself in situations where there is food without knowing it. And you're going to reach a point where the obsessions are becoming compulsive. And the compulsion is becoming impulsive. You become shaky, tremulous, you get irritated and angry, and now the primitive brain is punishing you because you're not eating. Eventually, if you don't eat, you're going to go into seizures, you're going to go into cardiac problems, you could die. Exactly the same way addiction <coughs> will do it. So you develop the disease of addiction and for some reason you want to stop doing it. And now you said to yourself, prefrontal cortex, I'm not going to use those opiates anymore. 
So 24 hours later, you're sweaty, you're anxious, you're irritable, you have diarrhea, you're vomiting, you're becoming dehydrated. You drink fluids, you eat, you try everything, you throw up, up, everything out, and now you start developing this desire for these opiates that is followed by severe cravings for the opiates. You don't do nothing because you are containing these forces. You have a strong prefrontal cortex, let's call it that way. And you say, I'm not going to abuse. You're now prostrated in bed, you're nauseous, vomiting, sweaty, sick, tachycardia, your pulse is high. You're shaky, you cannot make sense of what's going on, you're confused, you're very depressed, anxious, panicky, but you still say no. Now, this primitive brain, which is so much in love with the high, of course, dopamine is going to drop. Drop of dopamine, you feel miserable, anxious, depressed, hopeless, even suicidal sometimes. So he intensified the signal in this direction, and this is trying to overwhelm you. You still don't do it. Now he recruits the memory of past good events with drugs, and he's going to put in your mind or your dreams. Get high. Patients report when they're getting sobriety, into sobriety, dreaming that they are high, and they wake up high. That's a trick from the primitive brain to release dopamine while dreaming, but putting some positive thoughts about drugs so you can go ahead and do it. This is like evil, right? Well, these forces keep growing and growing and growing, and you are stubborn enough and says, no, I'm not going to do it. So now, this is nucleus accumbens is going to recruit this area that we haven't talked about. And the memory system is going to motivate this area. This is the amygdala. Let me explain the amygdala. You put an electrode in a cat into their amygdala, and the cat is going to go extremely violent. It's going to show the teeth, and it's going to become extremely violent. It's going to be ready to fight or flight. So you release another neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, and the amygdala is now integrated into bombarding the prefrontal cortex. So the amygdala is going to give you the emotions that are usually negative, and you respond with anger, violence, acting out, antisocial behavior. You're still not going for drugs. And I'm talking right now about the withdrawal reaction. The amygdala give up and says, it's not working. And of course, the nucleus accumbens is saying, yeah, I know. I'm not getting dopamine from here. So he recluded the most primitive part of the brain, which is where the most primitive functions are. And now the amygdala is going to tell this guy here, kill him. This is going to make the patient go into tachycardia. It's going to increase his body temperature. It's going to make him go into seizures. And eventually that patient could die. That's how strong it is. So we have around one percent of the population <coughs> struggling with this disease, around three million people, not counting addiction to nicotine, caffeine, and a lot of people doing marijuana on a regular basis. And there is around three million people struggling with this mess. They cost society $70 billion every year between disease, foster care, accidents, incarceration, loss of productivity, homelessness, and destruction of the life. This is clearly epidemic and is affecting society in any way you look at it. But we thought it was not a disease. We thought it was 
antisocial stupidity from humans that are stupid. And we realize now that it is not that simple. So, if you give this patient opiates, he will shut down the signal to the amygdala, who will shut down the signal to the primitive brain, and his vital signs will go back to normal. He's still suffering, so we gotta give a little more opiates. So these can quiet down the motivational system, and I left out one area that is here in pink. This is the limbic system. It's where the emotions in humans are located. So basically, he also attacked this area, and this area also overwhelmed. But I wanted to say some words about the limbic system, because the limbic system, the emotions in human, is directly related with mental illness. So when the limbic area is included, that's when the patients start manifesting psychiatric symptoms. So we got into a serious problem. Patients go for help for their addiction. They don't mention even their drugs. All they tell the psychiatrists, all the medical doctors is, my emotions. So they end up being diagnosed with a primary psychiatric condition, usually major depressive disorder. If there is some involvement of the amygdala and the emotional system, he probably will get a different diagnosis, bipolar disorder. But if for some reason the dopamine tone is not enough to motivate you, and without dopamine we don't pay attention, we become restless and we get the restless legs. You cannot learn, you cannot focus, because you don't have the motivation. So a new disease show up, which is called attention deficit disorder. But if the amygdala overreacts and releases too much norepinephrine, that patient is going to develop another mental illness called anxiety disorder and panic attacks or panic disorder. So my personal view about psychiatry is changing dramatically. I believe the epidemic of addiction with these diseases being diagnosed in a very inappropriate or unethical way, we basically will not see an epidemic of addiction. We're going to see an epidemic of psychiatric diseases. Psychiatric diseases, disorders, is the number one problem in the United States. It is being prescribed, this medication, by 75 to 80 percent by primary care physicians. And maybe 20 percent by psychiatrists. So most people with addiction carry with them a primary psychiatric disorder. They are massively being treated with psychiatric medication and the addiction is totally ignored for the destruction of this human being who in his denial believe that this is not a problem. It's my doctor, he told me I'm bipolar. Bipolar disorder is 1.5% of the population. You wanna know how much it is today? up to 20% of the population carry the diagnosis of bipolar at one point in their life. Probably we have here 10 or 20 who has been diagnosed bipolar. But bipolar is different from this. And the question is, if the patient is depressed, he has depression. 